Thanks, Sam. Good to be here at Box. As the CTO of Quixie, I think a lot about the future. And specifically, I think about the future of apps on the web. Today, the picture looks like this. We've got apps over here, the web over here. It's kind of an adversarial picture, like, oh, which one of these is going to win out? You have articles like, apps are dying and the web is the future, or here's a graph where it looks like app usage is trending up and the web maybe is stagnant, or apps and the web, are they enemies or allies? So it seems like we have apps versus the web today, like one of them is going to take over. So this evening I want to tell you a new trend that I think is larger and more fundamental. I call it the functional web, and it's going to change how we think about the trends that have to do with apps and the web. I'm going to tell you how to think about this trend, why it's happening, and how when you make products for your business, it should affect how you think about those. So let's start from the beginning. In the beginning we have wants, right? You want things. For example, you want to listen to the Beatles. You want to have a clean house. You want to eat sushi. And maybe you have some stretch goals, like maybe you want to go to Mars one day, and it would be great to reverse aging. <laughs> so we, we want all these things. To get what you want, we build technology. Technology helps us get what we want. For example, if you want a clean house, you can use a broom, you can use a mop, you can use a vacuum cleaner. All these different technologies to do the same function of having a clean house, the same thing you want. Now, if you want to go to Mars or reverse aging, it's a lot harder. In fact, it's not really feasible with today's technology. If you just look at the set of technologically feasible wants, then those are called the functions, the functions of present day technology. So going to Mars, I have it not listed as a function, but if one day NASA comes out with this really futuristic triangular space shuttle, then go to Mars will be a function, and the set of functions is going to keep expanding thanks to technology. But today, you know, you can't go to Mars. It's not a function. All right, well, some technologies have more than one function. I mean, what is this? This is a four-function calculator, right? It has four functions. It can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Okay, look at a paper clip. A paper clip can hold your papers together. It can also press reset buttons. Or even the broom from before. Sure, you can use it for having a clean house, but it can also extend your reach. Okay, so where does that leave the web? How does the web fit into this picture of wants and technologies? Well, in the 90s, the web started out as a technology. A technology with these things called web servers, these computers that lived everywhere around the world, and they had files on them. And the web would let you access people's files anywhere you were through the internet. So the web fell into this technology category in the 90s. Now, just like a paperclip has more than one function, so does the web. The web actually has a whole space of functions. And all the functions in the 90s had something to do with reading content, some form of content. So for example, one of the sites that was around in the 90s is called ShakespeareOnline.com. ShakespeareOnline.com lets you read Shakespeare plays, like here's the full text of Hamlet, courtesy of Shakespeare Online. The way that works is that there's this file called Hamlet.html that lives on the Shakespeare Online server. And I can access that file remotely from my computer, and I can get this function, read Hamlet. Okay, but I don't just get this function for free. I have to type something into my computer. I have to locate which file I want. And to do that, I can use a thing called a uniform resource locator to locate that resource. So URL for short. If I want to read Hamlet, I just type shakespeareonline.com slash play slash hamlet.html in my browser, and then I'm reading Hamlet. The URL connects me to the resource. If I want to read Romeo and Juliet, it's the same story. There's a file called Romeo.html, and I have a URL that I can use to get to that file. OK, but that, that's the story in the 90s. But since then, things have changed a lot, right? The web has gotten so much bigger in terms of what functions it can do for us today. Just think about all the things you do on the web today that you really didn't do in the 90s. You network with your friends on the web today. You do your banking. You, you watch videos. You play games, and you use maps. So all of these things really aren't reading content. They're fundamentally different functions of the web today. They're fundamentally different functions, and they're backed by a fundamentally different technology. 
it's not servers and files anymore. It's actually a new technology invented in the late 90s that plays a key role in all this. It's called JavaScript. JavaScript is a programming language that lets you write scripts that run in the user's browser as opposed to the, the server sending you a file. So here's what the picture looks like today. It's a much larger web that's powered largely by JavaScript and not just server send new files. It seems like the web has totally changed out from under us, like nothing's the same anymore about the web, except something really is the same. Something hasn't changed in the, in the web's entire 20 year history. It's the same today as it was in 1993. I'm talking about the URL. Right? The URL is still in your browser today. But the thing is, the URL is supposed to be a resource locator, right? The URL was originally there to let you read content by locating files on people's servers. That's what resource locator stands for. So why is it around today when the web of today isn't made out of these resources? It's made out of largely JavaScript running on your user's computer. Why do all these modern functions that the web can do still have URLs when it was originally a resource locator? If you understand the answer to that, then you'll understand what the shift to the functional web is. So today the, U the URL is actually not a resource locator anymore. Today the URL has a fundamentally different role. So let's go see what the URL is up to today. Let's see what role it plays in the modern web. How many of you know what is the most popular video on YouTube in 2006? Anybody? Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know about the zoo one, but it's, uh, so I looked it up, it's Evolution of Dance. Evolution of Dance is a guy named Judson Lapley who went on, who posted a video on YouTube of himself doing dances throughout the ages. So here's a little disco, and uh, look at the URL up here. You can see it's youtube.com slash watch question mark V equals, and then a big string that identifies which video you, you want to play, so in this case Evolution of Dance. Okay, you can see I paused the video at 50 seconds in because it's so convenient for my talk that he's pointing to the URL. <laughs> so what if I want to share this particular disco move that Mr. Lakely is doing? What if I want to share that with my friend Matt? So there is a button on YouTube called Share. Let's click that. Okay, and then I can copy this URL. And notice it ends with a T equals 50. So that basically means that it's adding a T equals 50 S up here to the end of the URL. So that's supposed to represent the fact that I'm 50 seconds into the video and that's what I want to share. So now, if Matt takes that URL and pastes it into his web browser, this is what Matt sees. So it's that exact same move. You see, he didn't have to start from the beginning. It's the same video and it's the same timestamp where it starts playing. All right, so the URL did something really cool today on YouTube. It identified this function that I wanted to do called play evolution of dance starting at 50 seconds. Right? Think about how different that is from locating a resource on the web. And really there was no web server with files involved here. That wasn't the technology underlying this URL. Instead what happened was there was some JavaScript running in the browser and the JavaScript took a look at the URL and it concluded that it should issue a command to this video player and tell the video player to start playing the video at 50 seconds. That's what happened on the web today. And I have one more example for you. Let's, let's look at Google Maps. So I have another friend, Lior, who loves taking vacations. So I figured, uh, hey, I'll go, go on Google Maps and I'll check out the beaches of Waikiki. Maybe I can give Lior a suggestion of where to go. So I go to Waikiki Beach and I'm just zooming in. I'm just checking out the place. Let's see how far I can zoom in. So I, you can see I got a street level view and I can actually see the beach right from this road. So it's pretty cool. I want to share this with Lior. So there's this button over here that lets me get a URL so that I can then send it to Lior, and he's supposed to get the same view inside Google Maps. So it's the same story that if Lior clicks this URL, he's going to get this exact same map, same zoom level, and with the same Waikiki search typed into the search box. Now, this URL is a lot longer than you saw on the screen. It's actually an enormous URL, so let's unpack it a little bit. This part here, the LL equals 21.3 comma negative 157.8. Well, LL stands for latitude longitude. So these are actually the geo coordinates of where the map is centered right now. It's centered around Waikiki. And then this part here, Z equals 19, Z stands for zoom level. So this captures the fact that I've actually zoomed in 19 times to get to that street view. And when Lior opens that URL, then he's going to be zoomed in 19 times. 
And then finally, Q equals Y key key. You know, that's just what I that's just what I typed into the search box. So it all adds up to Lior getting the exact same view on his computer that I had on my computer. It all adds up to this map view with the right beach and all that. Okay, so again, this is powered by the same JavaScript that powers YouTube today. It issues a command to the map by reading the text of your URL, and this all happens on your computer, and there's no web servers and files involved. All right, so here's today's picture of the web. We have all these different functions you can do. Some of them are about reading content, like Hamlet. Some of them aren't. Some of them are powered by web servers and files. Some of them are powered by JavaScript. The paradigm shift that I want you to consider is to look at the right side of this picture and group all the technology together and just think about that as the technological web. It's the set of technologies that powers these URL driven functions no matter what they are. Right, so if you do that, you get a fundamental shift. You get a less technology-centric view of the web. You start to think about the web in terms of functions rather than in terms of technology. The URL stops being a resource locator, which is something very bound to the technology of servers and files, and then instead the URL becomes a function identifier. If you can make that shift, then you've understood the functional web. The functional web is the web of functions, where URLs function as function identifiers. So the functional web is this new model. Does that mean that apps just lose and the web wins? Or where does that leave apps? Well, actually, I think the picture is a little different. So first of all, what are apps? Apps are technologies. Apps are pieces of software that can run on lots of different platforms. For example, you've got iPhone apps, Android apps, iPad apps, apps for your laptop, apps for your desktop, even apps for your car. They're pieces of software that can run on any platform. So here's where apps fit into the picture. They're a type of technology. And if you look at the functions that apps have, they're pretty cool functions. Like you can find restaurants, you can record your voice, you can uh, throw birds at pigs, and you can listen to Rihanna. So all these different functions that apps do, you know, they seem like cool functions and they seem like they're outside of the functional web though. I want to tell you a story that actually apps are part of the functional web the same way that websites are. Who likes karaoke? All right, maybe about half of you. Uh, I like karaoke and actually if after the talk if you guys want to put on some Backstreet Boys, you know, I can do another performance. <laughs> So last Friday, I wanted to go karaoke somewhere near my new apartment. So I took out my Android phone and I just searched for karaoke on my Yelp app. So I wanted to go with a friend, so I called up Matt and I said, uh, hey Matt, you wanna go, uh, wanna go karaoke tonight? And Matt has an iPhone. Uh, and Matt says, yeah, sure, where do you wanna go? And I'm looking at my Yelp results and I'm like, I don't know, help me pick. And Matt says, uh, okay, what are the options? So I say, well, just open Yelp and search for karaoke and you'll see him. So Matt does that. He opens Yelp, he searches for karaoke. Um, and then Matt says, uh, oh, here's a cool place. How about this place, uh, Mervyn's Lounge? It has uh, four stars, it, it looks like a cool place. And then I say, uh, wait, Mervyn's Lounge? I don't even see that as one of the options. What are you talking about? So it turns out that Matt was looking at a different set of Yelp results for me, because I was actually, uh, I was looking for Yelp near my house, and then Matt ended up looking for Yelp near his house. So then, uh, Matt, I had to tell Matt, like, okay, wait, open Yelp, do all these steps, you know, type karaoke. Uh, I had to basically be Matt's tech support to get him to do the same function that I got. And I was thinking, this is stupid. And it's a big problem. Not just for this specific example of Yelp, but for apps in general. It's a problem because every time I'm using an app and I just want to share with a friend what I'm doing in the app, then I have to be his tech support. I have to walk him step by step and say, you know, type this in, you know, press the search button. And after I do all that, it doesn't even necessarily work. Like he might still get results near him because I didn't tell him the exact right instructions, even though I've already gotten it working on my phone. So I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about the functional web and I was thinking, why doesn't this just have a URL 
You know, I would love to just send Matt some URL and have him load up the exact same thing in his phone that I see in my phone, even though he's on Android and I'm on iPhone and we're both, I mean, I'm on Android, he's on iPhone, we're both using native apps. Okay, so I was thinking, you know, this function that Yelp has, find karaoke nearly run, it would be great to just put it on the functional web and give it a URL. And then I remembered, wait a minute, Yelp has a website. I use it all the time. You can just search karaoke on Yelp's website, right? And when you do that, you actually get a URL right here. It's right here. So this URL, the fact that it exists and the fact that it captures the function of searching Yelp for karaoke, so that, that proves that Yelp is on the functional web. Yeah, so just like having a clean house is something you can do with a broom and a mop and a vacuum cleaner. Similarly, if you want to find karaoke nearly wrong, you can do it with a technological web or you can do it with apps. And in fact, there's a lot more than two ways to find karaoke nearly wrong, even with Yelp. Even with Yelp, there's six ways to do it. There's the technological web and then you've got the Android app, the iPhone app, the Windows phone app, the iPad app, and the Blackberry app. Six different ways to do it. We were originally asking apps versus the web. You know, what's the relationship? Where do apps fit into the picture? We were able to shed a lot of light on it when we realized that the functions that apps do have a lot in common with the functions that the web does. So in fact, the picture I want to show you is that the technological web includes apps. Apps are just a functional web technology, just like web servers with files are, and just like JavaScript is. That means that when I was talking with Matt on the phone and I had this, this function that I wanted to send to Matt, then I should have been able to just text him this URL. I should have just been able to say like, hey Matt, click here. And then he clicks on it and then the URL takes him directly into Yelp. That's really what should have happened today. We have the technology to do that. But that didn't happen today. Today what happens is one of two things. So if I really had sent Matt this link, then it would have opened in his mobile Safari, right? It would have opened in a web browser. And the web browser is inferior because on the web browser, then you have all these extra user interface elements on the top, right? You've got the, uh, the back button and all these things. And it also feels less snappy. It's a different experience and it's not as good as the app. So we don't really like that. And if I wanted him to do it in the Yelp app, then that would have been a problem too because I would have had to just tell him step-by-step -step instructions for how to get there. So there's really no way to just straightforwardly map a URL, have an app access a URL today. Even though the web and apps are doing the same functions, only the web seems to be supporting this idea of opening URLs in general. So it raises the question of why is that? Why is the web, why has the web had a 20 year history with a lot of success of opening URLs and then apps never got on board, even though there's so many reasons that they should both be doing it, only the web is doing it. What's the deal? And the answer is just that apps aren't even trying to do it. Apps never try to do it, and the web actually has to try. It actually takes effort for the web to do it. it so when you're on hamlet.html, um, it actually used to not take that much effort. In the old days, if you wanted hamlet.html to, to be part of a URL, all you had to do was drag hamlet.html into the place folder of your, uh, of your web server's directory tree. That's all you had to do and then you'd get this nice URL for free. But now this is what YouTube has to do if they want t equals 50 s. If they want that to open the video at 50 seconds, it's not as easy as dragging and dropping a file. They actually have to write code. They have to write JavaScript code that looks at the URL figures out that 50 is the time you want to start at, and then commands the video player, write some sort of code to say, okay, video player, you got to start at 50 seconds on the page. This is a conscious effort that websites are doing today. And the reason they're doing it is because URLs are so useful. It's a general fact about the functional web that if you want to make a good functional URL, and if you want to make it easy for your users, then that takes hard development work. The web knows that today. But today it's time for apps to become better citizens of the functional web by doing the same kind of URL opening.
Okay, so this is kind of an, a nice picture that ties everything together with the web and apps. But the obvious question then is, what about you and your business and the products that you make? Why do functional URLs help you? Why should you get on board on this model? Well, I'm going to give you five reasons why I think this is something you should pay attention to. The first is bookmarking. So let's imagine the year is 2005 when Google Maps just came out. This is what the view of Waikiki would have looked like if I zoomed in as much as I can. It's a satellite view. It's pretty nice, but it's, you know, it's grainy. The people look like really tiny specks. And, but it's, it's still nice, so I would have bookmarked it, and I would have said, okay, this is a nice bookmark to have any time I'm thinking of Waikiki. All right, fast forward to 2009. This is what I see if I go back in 2009. It's a much sharper view of the beach. So what happened? What happened is that I wanted to get the same function of looking at the beach, and originally, the way I got it was with satellites, right? Google commissioned satellites that are in space taking pictures with this grainy resolution. And then in 2009, they have these airplanes flying around and the airplanes are taking pictures and they're closer to the ground. And then in 2010, now I've got a street view. So Google's actually driving vans around with cameras inside taking pictures. And this time, the pictures are so high resolution, they're so not blurry that now they have to intentionally blur the people's faces for privacy. So the idea is that this function is what I wanted to bookmark. If you want to do bookmarking right, then you have to do it with a functional URL because it doesn't matter whether the technology is a satellite or a plane or a Google Maps van. All that matters is that the user wants to go back to a function. So the second one is sharing. So let's say I'm using Google Maps and uh, I want to go to Waikiki. I want to tell Lior how to go check out this view of Waikiki. So the last thing I would say is I'd say, hey Lior, you know, scroll to the left and zoom into Hawaii and zoom in as much as you can and then you'll kind of be there. I would never think about saying that because I'm so used to the convenience of the URL. So doesn't this remind you of the example with Matt where I couldn't share my, my state with Matt when I was trying to go out to karaoke with him? So this is such an obvious failure mode that can be fixed just by implementing URLs. Okay, the third is learning curves. The other day I received an email from my office IT guy about how to add a printer. How many times have you gotten an email like this with all these instructions like, okay, click this, click that, and then this screen's gonna come up, just type in this IP address, right? And it's stupid because we have a technology that lets you one click go straight into the state you want. So if the printer setup software only implemented functional URLs, then my IT guy could have sent me a URL. This is not theoretically any harder than the idea of going to a specific Google Maps zoom level at a specific geo coordinate. This is doable today. The thing that's holding people back is the abstract conception of the functional web. That's it. So next is interoperation. If you're making software today, you know that you have to be on different platforms. Like look at Yelp today. Right, it's on all these platforms. And it's kind of hard to synchronize the code that's running on all these different platforms. Right, it's hard to have your architecture be so perfectly modular. Well, the answer is functions. If you conceive of your product as a bunch of functions, so find karaoke in early run, review local businesses, look up store hours. If you think about your product as a region of functions on the functional web, like that's how you identify Yelp as this region of functions. And then you give it functional URLs. So you give it a bunch of URLs under the domain yelp.com. If you do that, then you've got interoperability. Because this Windows phone could be doing this function find karaoke nearly Ron. And then this Android phone could just get the same thing via the URL. That's all it takes. The key here is to use the URLs, use the functional web as the functional skeleton of what all the different technological implementations of your product are doing. And that brings me to the fifth one, which is wants, right? So I mentioned the functional skeleton. You don't really care about technology. You care about what your consumers want. And users don't care about technology, right? When Google Maps started using a street view and driving vans around, I didn't get pissed off. I was like, this is great. This is better. Thanks. Right? And your technology is bound to change. Right now, maybe you've got a laptop accessing Yelp. Well, Google Glass is coming out, maybe you'll use that to access Yelp. Or maybe we'll even get neural implants and we'll just have Yelp in our brains. 
right? All that stuff can happen and it seems hard to predict. The thing is though that wants change a lot more slowly than technology. Wants are relatively invariant and wants are what matter, which means functions are what matter. When you're thinking about how to conceptualize your product and architect it for different platforms, it's this idea of functions capturing wants that makes it a useful concept. So five reasons why functional URLs are good for you and your business. You've got bookmarking, sharing, learning curves, interoperation, and then wants. If you can get all these things, that's gonna help your business. Now, I should say, some businesses are already kind of on board with this. Actually, I happen to know that Box is doing a great job of using functional URLs in their apps, and I've seen it. The reason I'm still bringing this up, though, is number one, it's not that common. So most apps actually don't do this. And then number two, the apps that are doing it are kind of rolling their own functional web implementations. They're taking it upon themselves to connect the technology to the functions in whatever, whatever schema is convenient for them at the time. There's no global standard for it. So I can tell you that at Quixie, search engine for apps, we're thinking a lot about how to standardize this idea of the web being made out of functions and how different apps can have a uniform way of accessing those functions using URLs. So apps on the web are not really in conflict after all. In fact, apps on the web are converging. So it's not about, oh, the apps are going to take over, the web is going to take over, or, oh, you should use apps because it's going to drive more eyeballs, right? Those are relatively small trends. The big trend is the growth of the functional web. The big trend is about how apps on the web both are growing the functional web by incorporating other technologies into the technological web. The other day I went on dominoes.com because I wanted to order a pizza. Okay, well that pizza came and I realized, wait a minute, I was, you know, that had a URL, so pizza's on the functional web. And then I went to Zappos and I checked out some Ugg boots and I'm like, oh, I guess boots are on the functional web now. And then I was like, oh, I need a cab. So I realized hundreds of cabs are on the functional web right now, accessible via URL. And then I needed a task done, so I went on TaskRabbit. And now my assistant is on the functional web. And then I needed a date, so I went on OkCupid. And now my date is on the functional web. <laughs> and look what I found on the functional web the other day. It's a 1.2 million year old Acheulean era flint hand axe. Now, anthropologists think that the hand axe was used to do a lot of different functions. So now, butchering animals, digging for tubers, and stripping bark from trees are on the functional web. The real trend is that the functional web is growing. And in the long term, I don't see any reason why the functional web shouldn't grow to encompass the entire region of functions that are technologically possible. In other words, everything should be somehow accessible via URL. Everything that we care about should be mapped to technology in this uniform way. So, the functional web is a useful idea in order to understand trends. It's useful in order to understand how to work URLs into your product. If you understand this view in terms of wants and technologies of how your product should work, then you're going to understand a trend that I think has already been going on for a couple decades and I think it's going to continue for decades to come. The rise of the functional web. Thanks a lot. I'll be happy to take your questions.